Okay, next one is Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. All right, now here's our new one. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, if you can memorize all three of those, do you have a pretty good presentation of some of the key points in the book of Romans? I really believe you do. So last week, we began looking at this marvelous chapter in Romans chapter 12. Paul is making a major shift in his letter as he moves from providing doctrine to providing practical application. <clears throat> through exhortations and commands to us as believers. And the verses we looked at last Sunday, verses one and two are what it all hinges on. So I don't know if you've reflected much on it this week, but the Lord is pointing out to me how often I tend to want to crawl off that altar as a living sacrifice instead of submitting to him. Now, I'm sure he's been trying to get my attention about it for a while, but you know what it takes sometimes to get us to notice? It takes the renewing of your mind from his word to remind us that all of Christian service, all of ministry, all that is value of value in my role in the kingdom of God begins with my willingness to present my body as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, with it, we also said our ability to do this depends on two things. Anybody remember what those are? Motive and commitment. Motive is something you have to be brutally honest with yourself about because the heart is deceitfully wicked, right? And oftentimes we can convince ourselves we're doing something with the right motive when it's not. And what is the right motive? We should be doing everything for what? For his glory. We should desire only to worship and serve the Lord because he is worthy and he has shown us great mercy. And if we ever discern that our motive for doing something in ministry is because of a benefit that we receive, you need to come before the Lord, confess that you've made it about you. And we're going to see in verse three in a moment, Paul addresses this very issue. But I've spent a little more time this week thinking about the area of commitment. Now, if I am fully committed to something, I have the attitude that nothing is going to get in the way of fulfilling what I've committed to do. I work with a, a woman that last semester, she fractured a bone in her ankle and she had to wear a boot. And about maybe three, four weeks into this, she was going to have to wear it for a minimum of six weeks. She had mentioned to me that she's scheduled to run a 5K within a couple of weeks of the boot coming off. And she said, I've already talked to my doctor to ask him, you know, can I do that? I mean, even if all I can do is walk it. Now, in my book, that's commitment. That would not be first thing on my mind if I'm in a boot that I want to run a 5K. And shes I don't think she's a regular runner as a passionate thing about it. And so what I would say is I think most of us should be able to reflect back on when we first came to the Lord and the kind of zeal and excitement that you felt. I know for myself, I was so fully committed in those early days after giving my life to Christ that it resulted in feeling such great joy and a real awareness of his presence in my life. And I would wager that for the majority of us, we see our moment of salvation in the distance of the rearview mirror of our life. 
And that might mean that we need a tune-up of sorts. The Apostle Paul knew this, and that's why he wrote the following to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. And for this reason, if you look back at verse 5, it's because of Timothy's sincere faith. I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline is in the NASB. What is it in King James? Sound mind. There you go. Paul knew that without diligent attention, the fire that was lit at our salvation can begin to smolder and dim. When that happens, we can become timid and we can stop presenting ourselves to God for his service. And it's our responsibility to kindle afresh that commitment in order to be able to exercise the gifts that God has given to us. And we'll have more on the gifts next week. I mention all of this because God brought something to my mind this week as I thought about my commitment to submit myself as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, I heard a sermon once, it's been a few years ago, kind of took me by surprise. The preacher was a man in his 60s, <clears throat> and he was preaching on sins that damage our effectiveness as Christians. So I was expecting to hear a sermon about, you know, drunkenness, stealing, adultery, you know, something out of the big 10. Um, and do you know what it was that he said that was the struggle in his life? It was the sin of making comfort an idol in his life. Mm. He spoke about how, especially at this stage in his life, a stage many of us are now at, he had reached the point of no longer being consumed by pursuit of things in this world the same way that he was when he was younger. I mean, you know, think about it. Typically in our younger years, we're working really hard to provide for our family and hopefully set something aside and get ahead. And sometimes we'll set a goal of, gosh, you know, I really want this. And you're working hard to get that. And you know, it, it, it can become very distracting as you it, it have that pursuit going on. It's a challenge not to fall into that trap. But for most of us past the age of 55 or so, we've probably accumulated a measure of wealth that allows us to be comfortable. I mean, honestly, I live in a nice house and I have a comfortable bed, okay, compared to what other people sleep in. And a reclining sofa, and I have loads of entertainment at my fingertips when I am at home. And if I'm really honest with myself, I have a real tendency to choose to spend my time making my flesh comfortable. Now, I'm not saying we should all live like Fred Flintstone and throw out the Tempur-Pedic and sleep on a slab of stone. But what I am saying is I need to take an honest look at my attitude about my comfort. Are there things in my life that are actually idols because I haven't been willing to place them on the altar as a sacrifice? Are there things God wants me to sacrifice, but I don't know it because I've been unwilling to ask him or I've been unwilling to listen to him when he's trying to speak to me. Now, maybe it isn't stuff that you've accumulated as much as it is how you spend your leisure time or the habits you've developed is being on your phone, watching a lot of TV or movies, social media, shopping or decorating something that's taking a big chunk of your time and you're unwilling to ask the Lord if he wants you to give it up or restrict it? Or do you have some leisure activities like golf? or fishing that takes the lion's share of your time and you're unwilling to ask the Lord if that is really how he wants you to spend that much time. Now, I don't mean to get too personal or step on too many toes here, but I think we've grown up with the American dream of reaching retirement age with the goal of being comfortable and enjoying our leisure time. Commercials abound to try to sell us on this idea. And we should have plenty of resources to allow us to enjoy leisure time now that we're not being consumed by work or by kids that are at home. And please don't misunderstand me. 
I am not saying that I believe God wants us all to sell our homes and live in a hovel in an extremely monastic lifestyle. That's not it. What I am saying is I know I've been making choices that makes my flesh comfortable without realizing I'm doing it and without taking it before the Lord to ask him if that is according to his will, what I'm doing. And so sometimes I've allowed certain things to take far more of my time than they should. It is wonderful to enjoy a beautiful home or take a vacation or play golf or watch a movie or go fishing or just relax. And I fully acknowledge that the aging body needs a little more TLC than it did when I was 25. Okay. However, I must be careful not to allow my flesh to make being comfortable an idol. How do I know if it's an idol? If it is something that I would never consider laying on the altar if God asked me to give it up. Now, we can flip flippantly say, I'm willing to place it all on the altar before you, Lord. But I think you may find it insightful if you will spend a little time taking inventory, not only over your possessions, but also the use of your time and bring each one before the Lord individually to ask him if it pleases him or if it has become an idol to you. Now, I know I've probably stepped on some toes, but I share this only to say that Paul tells us to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, which is our spiritual service of worship. And consequently, if I want to fulfill this in my life, I must be sure to bring it all before him on a regular basis. And if I don't do that, I'm potentially giving Satan a foothold to use something that's not necessarily evil as an idol in my life. And as we age, I think the means of temptation changes from how Satan operates on us when we're younger. So I'm simply offering this as something to think about since I know it's something the Lord is prompting me to consider. So I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have any insights or comments you want to share? And please don't cast stones if it means the next time you're on the golf course, you're going to feel guilty. That's not my intent. That's not my intent. And I know Brother Park says he has a lot of ministry that takes place on the golf course. I'm just saying whatever it is in our lives, we got to be sure and ask the Lord if that's how he wants us to, to be useful for him. Yes. Sometimes it's just um, two things. I know there have been times when I didn't want to get up and go to church. But I can just walk to the home and go but God really put it on my heart one day that there might be someone there that I can encourage. Mm -hmm. And it's not all about me. <laughs> so sometimes it's a simple thing like that. And another thing is, I know a lot of the younger women were encouraging the older women yes. to come to class because they need role models. And so sometimes it's just simple. Little okay. I, I don't know. Could y'all hear Donna online? So let, let me say it again, it, just in case you didn't hear. Donna brought up two excellent examples of how our flesh can get in the way of what, how God wants to use us. And the first was, and this is not to put a guilt trip on anybody who's home today, because today you've got a legitimate reason. But she was saying there are times that she may wake up on a Sunday morning and her flesh just kind of craves, you know, I'll just stay in bed and I can watch this on TV. And God prompted her uh, on her heart to realize that sometimes your presence there, it may be necessary to encourage someone else, that we can't be those Lone Ranger Christians. And then the number two that she mentioned is that um, with the Thrive Conference, she's heard there's a number of the younger women who are really encouraging older women to be sure to attend because they need the encouragement and the mentorship from the older women. So sometimes we've, we've got to be careful that we're thinking not just of our flesh, but we're thinking collectively within the body. How could God? Be? And that is exactly the point we're looking at today. Kelly. Yeah, there you go. Yep. 
our bodies were not meant to sit idle. Mm -hmm. They were meant to continue working. We were for retired and doing it in a different way. There you go. So for those of you online, Kelly just shared, God did not design our bodies to just sit on a couch and be idle. In <laughs> fact, I, I, even in my early 40s, I vividly remember uh, my doctor, you know, at my annual asking all these questions and she strongly emphasized it is so important. You do not quit moving. You've got to keep exercising because that's what's going to make the difference as you age. And so, as Kelly said, mm -hmm. and, and I've heard many pastors say there is no retirement from ministry. There's no retirement from Christian service. That's a lifelong commitment. So even though you may retire from quote unquote work. There's something we all need to get up and do within the body of Christ. And we need to be careful because our flesh will have a tendency. What, what is it? Is it inertia, an object that is it? Okay. Which one is it? That's a body at rest will stay at rest. Anyway, whatever it is, that, that's, that's what your flesh will try to do. If you stop moving, it's going to convince you. You just stay where you are. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, we can always be a witness. On, and, and that's why I'm saying don't feel guilty about it. Just make sure it's something you feel like God is, is telling you you're not out of proportion on anything because you're, you're giving into your flesh. So, all right. So let's move on. Now that we've reviewed what it means to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Remember that Paul says this is our spiritual service of worship. So in other words, it's the natural outflow of a life that's fully committed to the Lord out of gratitude for his incomparable mercies. So as we continue through these beginning verses in Romans 12, I want to suggest to you that there are three key relationships that are needed for true worship. The true worship that's shown in Romans 12, 1. And we just saw from verse 1 that the first key is our relationship to God. Your relationship to God is key. It all begins with a decisive but ongoing act to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God. You will be frustrated and unfruitful in your Christian life if you fail to get this relationship right. Then, Verse two gives us the key to being able to do this as believers. It is through being transformed by what? Renewing. The renewing of your mind. God's word is what will right your thinking when you go astray. And his word is what will keep you on the right path for your life. So the second key relationship is to God's word. Okay. Okay. Now, as an illustration of this, let me share a story told by Wayne Barber. He says, years ago, I was up in Alaska with my family, and I had the opportunity to fly in the cockpit of a 727. I loved it when we took off. There's nothing like being up in the front of the plane and seeing what's going on. The, we were uh, flying up to Prudhoe Bay on the Arctic Ocean, and I'd never been there before. The weather was perfectly clear as we flew, but as we got up there, I noticed when we made our bank around and were going to land on the airstrip, the pilot put everything on instrument rating. I thought, now that's interesting. As a matter of fact, I leaned forward and asked, why are you going in on instruments? It's clear as a bell. And the pilot said, Wayne, excuse me, I'm flying the plane. We'll talk about this later. So we came around on instrument rating and then landed the plane and it was still clear as a bell. So after we landed, I said, okay, you got to help me on this. I thought instrument landings were for fogged in conditions. And the pilot said, I can really tell you have never been here before. We have learned never to trust what we see or think we see. When we land up here, the fog can move in so quickly, we only trust what we know will land this plane. Now, what is the point of this story? It's a reminder, you can't trust what your eyes and your mind see. You've got to depend on the word of God to guide you. Once you present your body as a living sacrifice, you're responsible to stop calling the shots yourself. Instead, place your trust in the word of God to guide you from now on. 
failing to depend on him can have disastrous results overtake you just as quickly as unexpected fog can roll in. Now, we discussed last week how we are not to masquerade as one belonging to the world when we, in fact, belong to God. This is the not being conformed to the world part. But we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I mentioned last week that the Greek word for transformed is metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis. So let me point out one critical fact about what is involved in this transformation process, just in case you haven't thought about it. Okay, so I've got the life cycle of a moth up there. And as a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, we know the end result, what comes out will be a moth, or if it's a chrysalis, it comes out as a butterfly, all right? But it is essential. There is something that's very essential in this process. What is it that happens in this cocoon or this poop, pupa stage that is going on here? Transformation. And what do you think is necessary for that to take place? Time. Time. That's the key. Time. As that caterpillar stays closed up, there is a process that is taking place in that quiet, private environment. Change is not instantaneous and neither will it be instant. Now, some people come to the Lord and they are instantly changed from many things, but you're typically not instantaneously changed by the transforming of the renewing of your mind. Okay. Instead, you have to consider it takes time. Now you can do it one of two ways. You could shut yourself up in this process in a very intensive immersion, much like the apostle Paul did for the first three years after his conversion, or maybe like Josh has been doing for the last five years. I think that has been his, he's had the ability to just really hone in and focus, but it can also be a more gradual process, which is probably what most of us have to do. But if you don't dedicate regular consistent time closed off from distractions to be in God's word with the Holy Spirit as your teacher, you're not going to be transformed. And why is this so critical? What does the world want to do? Yeah, it wants to squeeze you into its mold. And so sometimes even in the guise of Christianity or the church, you're going to find philosophies and psychologies that are not biblical. And how will you recognize those things, if you haven't been transformed by the renewing of your mind, <clears throat> listen to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 11 through 13. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? For even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Skip on down to verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, Here's an interesting note I discovered when studying the life cycle of a butterfly. If you take the time spent in the larva stage, when it's a caterpillar, the pupa stage and the cocoon, and then the adult stage, and you calculate the percentage of time that's spent in that pupa stage or the cocoon, guess what it comes out to be? One seventh. How much of our week has the Lord commanded us to spend in rest and reflection? One seventh. Interesting. Finally, the third key in our relationships is seen in verse three, and that is your relationship to yourself. Listen to verses three through six a. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, 
So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. Now, Paul begins by saying that every man among you, talking about believers, is not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. And haven't we all met people who think more highly of themselves than they ought to think? So I found a story about former NFL coaching legend Don Shula. During the height of his career, he took his wife on a vacation to a small seaside town in Maine, and he had figured it was a place where they could relax anonymously. So it was raining when they arrived, and they decided to take in a movie. As they entered the small theater, the show had not started yet, and the lights were still up. And to their surprise, the scattered handful of people applauded their entrance. After they were seated, Don said, I guess there's nowhere I'm not known. And his wife smiled and said, and loved, dear. Mm -hmm. And a man seated nearby reached over and shook Don's hand. And Shula said, I have to admit, I'm kind of surprised you know me here. And the man responded with a puzzled look on his face. Should I know you? We're just happy to see you folks because the manager said he wasn't going to start the movie until at least two more people showed up. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this story is true or not, but it does illustrate human nature well, okay? Paul cautions us against thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought because it is the more natural tendency that we have. The alternative to this, though, is not thinking highly enough of yourself and therefore believing you aren't worthy to be able or to be used uh, to, by God. Now, this is why Paul tells us to think so as to have sound judgment. If we have overinflated ourselves, then buckle up for a dangerous ride. As James 4, 9 says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And God is likely to pop your overinflated assessment of yourself at some point, just as what happened to Don Shula. But if you're underinflated or flat, buckle up for a bumpy ride that's likely to go nowhere. It's almost impossible to make any progress in your Christian journey if you are underinflated. You must bring your view of yourself into proper balance by thinking of yourself with that sound judgment. And the real danger in the church that Paul is addressing is what happens when a believer becomes puffed up in thinking that they know everything and can't trust anyone else to do anything in the body. Okay, let's be honest. Have you ever either worked with someone in the church or in your profession that if they gave you a job to do, they would either end up taking it back from you or they would redo it because it wasn't done the way they wanted it to be done. Okay. What does that cause you to think the next time you're given a task? Exactly. You probably won't do it because you know there's no point. Why bother? Now, in the church, we can't be a healthy body without allowing all the parts to function as they should. And we see from this passage in verse three God has given to each of us a measure of faith. And in verse four, we see that there are many, many members, but they don't all have the same function. Now, that's a really good thing, isn't it? Because even in this Sunday school class, we have grown now. And I'm so grateful for, it's been, I guess, a couple of years ago that it was kind of like overnight, our class doubled in size. And Krista and Debbie... And Francis came to me and said, look, we can tell you're doing too much. You know, you need some help. What can we do to help? And they have done a phenomenal job of trying to help everybody plug in. And so let me just mention a few of the different roles that some of you serve in this class. We are also grateful for Jalal's service in making sure we have coffee, especially on this cold morning. Amen. Okay. Now, we have some folks who take attendance, some who provide meals to aid during major life events, some who labor in prayer, some who keep us informed about mission opportunities, serve as treasurer, maintain stewardship of our money, and the list goes on, okay? 
No one can do all of these things. But as Brother Sam says, everybody can do something. There you go. Some jobs are more visible than others, but they're all important if our class is to be healthy and function as God desires. How tragic it would be if one person decided that their job was more important than all the others. And if no one appreciates me, then I'll just blow up this class. Okay. Now I know no one here would ever do that. But this is why Paul warns us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And I'm pretty sure we all know at least one church in our lifetime where there was a member, probably a staff member, oftentimes it is, but not necessarily, but that person became so puffed up that they caused an apparently healthy church to come apart at the seams. Humility is so important for us to be healthy as individuals and healthy as a body. All right. So in verse six, did you want to share something, Josh? No. Okay. Sorry. I, I thought I saw your hand go up. All right. Then in verse six, we see God has given each of us differing gifts and we're instructed to exercise them accordingly. How many of you have ever given a gift to someone, maybe an in-law or a relative that's hard to buy for, and you've never seen them wear it or use it? Okay. How does that make you feel? Can you imagine how God must feel when he has given gifts to us and we choose not to use them? So you may be wondering what your gift is, or you've never known exactly what the different gifts are. We're going to take some time next week to explore that and see if we can help figure it out. But for now, I simply want us to realize that we are all members of God's church. That makes us members of his body. And that means the church is not an organization, but an organism. It is a living, growing entity comprised of indiv individuals that are dependent on each other for their own health and growth. Now, I'm going to close our lesson today by sharing some information from the book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made by Dr. Paul Brand, who was a very outstanding surgeon that worked with the Leprosorium in the South last century. Anybody read this book before? Okay, good. I, I was, my nurses are out today, or most of them, Dean is here, so she can, can chime in if, if she has other insights she wants to share. Um, but what this doctor does is he draws some beautiful parallels between the way the body of Christ is to function compared to the human body. So Dr. Brand describes the diversity of the body cells like this. I am first struck by their variety. Chemically, my cells are almost alike, but visually and functionally, they are as different as animals in a zoo. Red blood cells resemble lifesaver candies, discs that pass through my blood loaded with oxygen to feed the other cells. Muscle cells, which absorb so much of that nourishment, are sleek and supple, full of coiled energy. Cartilage cells with shiny black nuclei look like bunches of black-eyed peas glued together for strength. Fat cells seem lazy and leaden like bulging white plastic garbage bags jammed together. Bone cells live in rigid structures that exude strength. Cut in cross-section, bone resembles tree rings, overlapping strength with strength, offering impliability and sturdiness. In contrast, Skin cells form undulating patterns of softness and texture that rise and dip, giving shape and beauty to our bodies. They curve and jut at unpredictable angles so that every person's fingerprint, not to mention his or her face, is unique. Now, the aristocrats of the cellular world are the sex cells and the nerve cells. A woman's contribution, the egg or ovum, is one of the largest cells in the human body. It's ovoid shape, just visible to the unaided eye. It seems fitting that all the other cells in the body should derive from this elegant and primordial structure. <clears throat> in great contrast to the egg's quiet repose, the male's tiny sperm cells are furiously flagellating tadpoles with distended heads and skinny tails. They scramble for position as if competitively aware that only one of billions will gain the honor of fertilization. <laughs> the king of cells, the one that 
I have devoted much of my life to studying, said Dr. Brand, is the nerve cell. It has an aura of wisdom and complexity about it. Spider-like, it branches out and unites the body with a computer network of dazzling sophistication. Its axons, wires carrying direct messages to and from the human brain, can reach a yard in length. I never tire of viewing these varied specimens or thumbing through books which render cells. Now, individually, they seem puny and oddly designed, but I know these invisible parts cooperate to lavish me with the phenomenon of life. Every second, my smooth cells modulate the width of my blood vessels, gently push matter through my intestines, open and close the plumbing in my kidneys. When things are going well, my heart contracts rhythmic, rhythmically and my brain hums with knowledge and I rarely give these cells a passing thought. But I believe these cells in my body can also teach me about larger organisms, families, groups, communities, villages, nations, and especially about one specific community of people that's likened to a body more than 30 times in the New Testament. I speak of the body of Christ, that network of people scattered across the planet who have little in common other than their membership in the group that follows Jesus Christ. My body employs a bewildering zoo of cells, none of which individually resembles the larger body. Just so, Christ's body comprises an unlikely assortment of humans. The body of Christ, like our own bodies, is composed of individual, unlike cells that are knit together to form one body. He is the whole thing and the joy of the body increases as individual cells realize they can be diverse without becoming isolated outposts. Now, what makes all the cells work together? What ushers in this highly specialized function of movement, sight, consciousness through the coordination of a hundred trillion cells? The secret to membership lies locked away inside each cell nucleus chemically coiled in a strand of DNA. DNA. Very good. Once the egg and sperm share their inheritance, the DNA chemical ladder splits down the center of every gene, much as the teeth of a zipper pull apart. DNA reforms itself each time the cell divides, two, four, eight, so on, until <clears throat> along the way, the cells specialize, but each carries the entire instruction book of, listen to this, 100,000 genes, all right? DNA is estimated to contain instructions that if written out would fill a 1,600 page books. A nerve cell may operate according to instructions from volume four and a kidney cell from volume 25, but both cells carry the whole compendium. And then he notes, the DNA is so narrow and compacted that if all the genes in all my body's cells were put together, they would fit into an ice cube. Yet, if the DNA were unwound and joined together end to end, the strand could stretch from the earth to the sun and back more than 400 times. The DNA provides each cell's sealed credential of membership in the body. Every cell possesses a genetic code so complete that the entire body could be reassembled from information in any one of the body cells. Just as the complete identity code of my body inheres in each individual cell, so also the reality of God permeates every cell in his body, linking us members with a true organic bond. I share the ecstasy of community in a universal body that includes every man and woman in whom God resides. Now, let me close with this example from his book. At the central railway station in Madras, India, lay a beggar woman more pitiful than the others I saw there. She'd positioned herself along the stream of passengers hurrying to catch their trains. Businessmen with briefcases passed by her, as did wealthy tourists and government officials. 
Like many Indian beggars, the woman was emaciated with sunken cheeks and eyes and bony limbs. But paradoxically, a huge mass of plump skin, round and sleek like a sausage, was growing from her side. It lay beside her like a formless baby, connected to her by a broad bridge of skin. The woman had exposed her flank with its grotesque deformity to give her an advantage in the rivalry for pity. Though I saw her only briefly, I felt sure that the growth was a lipoma, a tumor of fat cells. It was part of her and yet not, as if some surgeon had carved a hunk of fat out of a 300-pound person, wrapped it in live skin, and deftly sewn it onto this woman. She was starving. She feebly held up a spidery hand for alms, but her tumor was thriving. Nearly equally the weight of the rest of her entire body, it gleamed in the sun, exuding health, sucking life from her. Fat cells, the madras beggar's tumor, was composed the entirely of an orgiastic community of fat cells. In our figure-conscious Western world, the word fat connotes a lack of discipline and unnecessary aggravation of cells that should be reduced. But from the surgeon's vantage point, as he draws a knife across the skin, exposing layers of fat cells, the evil connotation is balanced by a sense of the value of fat. He goes on to describe the value of fat because you have fat cells and in the center, they hold one little tiny molecule of nutrition. And when the body needs it, they release it. Each fat cell is a storehouse containing a yellow globule of oil, which crowds out all the cell nucleus. Most of the time, the cell lies dormant while the body eats through enough food to fuel its need. Come famine, people with plenty of fat cells will be able to sit by while others starve. That's the most strategic function of fat. But sometimes a dreaded thing occur, uh, occurs in the body. A mutiny results in a tumor, lipoma, such as the one attached to the madras beggar. Now, a lipoma is a low-grade benign tumor. It derives from a single fat cell, skilled in its lazy role of storing fat, that rebels against the leadership of the body and refuses to give up its reserves. It accepts deposits, but ignores withdrawal slips. As the cell multiplies, daughter cells follow its lead and the tumor grows like a fungus, filling in crevices, pressing against muscles and organs. Occasionally, a lipoma crowds a vital organ like the eye, pushing it out of alignment or pinching a sensitive nerve and surgery is required. He says, I've removed such lipoma tumors. Under a microscope, they seem composed of healthy fat cells, bulging with shiny oils. The cells function beautifully, except for one flaw. They've become disloyal. In their activities, they disregard the body's needs. And so the beggar woman in Madras gradually starved while a limp lipoma that was part of her was engorging itself. A tumor is called benign if its effect is fairly localized and it stays within membrane boundaries. But the most traumatizing condition in the body occurs when disloyal cells defy inhibition and they multiply without any checks on growth and they spread rapidly throughout the body, choking out normal cells. And white cells armed against foreign, foreign invaders will not attack the body's own mutinous cells. This is what physicians fear and some of us in here have had to deal with. It's called what? Cancer. Now, the illustration is graphic. There are rebellious cells in the body of Christ. Some of them are benign in the sense that they ultimately don't seem to be killing the church. They just engorge themselves and take in and take in and take in and they never give out so that the church becomes emaciated and it can't function while they, all they want to do is get fatter and fatter and fatter. Their whole approach to things is, what are you going to do for me? What are you going to give me? What can I receive? And they take it in and take it in and never give out. And the church is weakened. And then there are those cells that are mutinous to the point that they literally kill the church because they overtly rebel against it. 
The church is always in danger of both kind. The lazy fat cells that basically starve the church of its usefulness, its power, its resources, and the evil cancerous cells that eat at its very life. Now, we don't want to be either, do we? We want to be the living, healthy cells that function for the glory of God and the health of the body of Christ. So my question, what I want you to dwell on, will you commit to your relationship to God, your relationship to his word, and your relationship to yourself in order to become that healthy, functioning member of the body? Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. So my comment is, there is a molecule, a laminar molecule, that holds all cells together, and it looks like a cross. Yes. And you know how you have the verse in Colossians that says, he holds all things together, that truly is in our body, the molecule of every cell together. Yes, let me, if those of you online, Kimmy just reminded us of the fact, if you've never looked this up, it, it, it it's awe-inspiring when you see it, that you have a, a molecule in your body called laminin, which if you look at, we talked about the different shapes, it's in the shape of a cross, and that's what holds everything together, just as Christ, it says, yeah, all things exist because of him. He holds everything together. So it's a beautiful reminder. Yes, Donna. Can you go back a couple of... Uh, sure. To the caterpillars? Yes. Let I me... used to raise monarchs. Why, why didn't I raise monarchs? Oh, hold on. I went to the wrong one. And Let me go so back. I'm very familiar with the stages of the caterpillar mm -hmm. or a butterfly. Um, it goes from the egg to the caterpillar. Then to the... Then to the uh, pupa, and then it becomes an adult. Oh, this is in the wrong order, isn't it? Oh, okay. So sorry. Yes. But what I was going to say is we would bring the eggs in when we could um, to protect them because there's predators in there. There's a little fly, and if it infiltrates the egg or the caterpillar when it's sunny, it kills it from the inside out. And thinking of the transformation, um, yes, and relating it, you don't know that it's been infected. It's been thriving, it's eating, it's moving, but inside it's dying. Mm -hmm. And once, once you get that caterpillar and it, and it is moving and thriving, here we go. Every so often, it has to leave the old skin behind, the shell, because it outgrows it. To, to get bigger. And I think it does that three times at once. It actually leaves this black blood and, and flows right out of it and moves on. And once it can get, if it survives and can get to the chrysalis stage, it goes up to honey. And that's where it forms its chrysalis. And it's protected until it becomes the butterfly. But even after it becomes a butterfly and it comes out, it has to stay for a while while its wings still look good. Mm -hmm. And then they have to fly. So there's a whole phase that it goes through. And it is so much like our system. Okay. I know you probably could not hear Donna online, but she has raised butterflies and she gave us a beautiful full-blown description of this life cycle in a way to help us see the parallel with the walking Christian life. So it might be worth reading up on if you're not familiar with it. Okay. Well, it's a little after 10. Are we, do we have anything else we want to share? Or are we ready to brave the cold and head across the street? <laughs> yes, Josh. Um, I thought it was interesting. The word transfigured. Yes. Right? Uh, metamorpho. Yes. Right? Uh, there's only one place in the entire Bible that word is mentioned. And it's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Exactly. So yes. When it is because it's like when you start renewing your mind, it'll look completely different. You'll start acting and then talk to people things in different. And it's a matter of uh, how much you put into the word. Exactly. Here's what Josh just pointed out. There's only the the uh, Greek word metamorpho or metamorpho, um, which is translated as transform here, 
is all, the only other place it's used is uh, when the word transfigure occurs when Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what's really interesting about that, if you think about it, Jesus Christ, he did not divest himself of being God. He was still fully God and fully man. But think of it this way. He took on the appearance, his, his shell, his outer covering was of a man. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, he allowed what was on the inside to become visible, which uh, is, is kind of mind blowing when you think about it, that he, he was just revealing what was there all along. And that's really the same process that should be happening with us in our Christian walk. He's, he's provided everything inside us. We've got to go through the process to let it be revealed for others to see. It's a beautiful reminder. Yes. Yes. Come, Lord Jesus, by John Piper. Mm -hmm. As Peter, who did you say, or as John, who did you say? And Peter said, You're the Christ. And he said, Well, so when you come to our son, so this is not being revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. And you see, and it talks about also in Second Corinthians, because I just read it this morning, that. Um, for God who said, Let the light shine out of darkness and shine in our hearts and give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It, it's our study and our prayer time that transforms our mind, but God eventually shows in our hearts who he is. It reveals to us our heart to our faith, to our study, to our prayer time. Absolutely. Great word to remind us that we've got to be in the word for God to be able to work in our hearts. Yes. One is, if you look at the life of Jesus, he was always going off by himself yes. to spend time with God. And it wasn't just in the morning. It was like all throughout the day that he was going to be along with God. And another thing is, sometimes transformation Let's look at coal and diamonds is like pressure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to be under pressure to make change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, sometimes we have to be under pressure to make changes. Um, I think we're ready to pray and dismiss. Before we do, if it's okay, uh, intendants people, we probably need to count our online uh, viewers. So it looks like, let's see. We have more. Mm, there's somebody that I'm not too sure who who it is, Nicole but yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. So yeah, Nicole's still here. So we've got one, two. Well, I tell you what, I, I will adjust it later. I'll just send Matt an update with uh, our online people as well. Yes, Mike. Susan's online. Susan's the one that's named. Great. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Know. Okay. All right, so I will I will make a note of that, and we'll get attendance uh, adjusted. And Brother Park, you know he he's he's got that that typical Baptist Sunday school mindset. You know if if it's breathing at all, count it. You know you, you got to make sure that you get as many on on your list as you can. So we'll try to help him out with that today. All right, that's right. And and yes, we have a visitor today too, my four year old granddaughter. So, and thank you, Jaylee, for not being loud. She has been very, very good today. So, all right, well, let's pray and dismiss. Father God, thank you. Thank you so very much for the truths that you have for us in your word. And the fact that you tell us that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You have never intended for us to be Lone Ranger Christians. You know that we have to be interdependent on each other in addition to being fully dependent on you. And I just pray as we meditate on this truth and we think about what we're seeing in the book of Romans and we begin to look at some of these specific instructions Paul is going to give us about the Christian life, that it was so important for him to establish this fact first, that we understand that everything is designed by you, that 
we operate in humility, but we don't operate in isolation from the rest of the body. And I just pray, Lord, as, as we go through this week, that you, you will impress on our hearts areas where maybe we've, we've been trying to take things over and do it ourselves and, and show us where we need to make sure that we're reaching out and encouraging others in the body. And we're functioning as you've called us to function and allowing them to function as you've called them to function. Lord, we want to pray specifically for safety and warmth and uh, protection for those who are either working in this cold weather. Uh, we, we, we pray that you will um, help us to uh, not be uh, damaged in any way by this cold coming in. I mean, we, we do thank you for the precipitation that should come. It's just a little unnerving uh, here in Texas. We're not well equipped to handle precipitation that that affects our driving and so i pray especially lord that if we don't need to be out that you will impress on us how important it is to stay home and you will protect those who have to be out uh, especially those who have to get out because of work and so lord we just lift all of this before you this week and we look forward to the message you have for us through brother sam please encourage him and speak through him. And may we hear your word specifically for each of us as we go to worship. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right. Y'all have a blessed day. Thanks so much for joining us. You did good.